to see this morning and again as we've just as we've been welcoming people in, seeing people from uh, our own country but also overseas, and everyone's very welcome as we gather to to hear from the Lord. And you know, we've got a, a few speakers today, um, and also we will have time to go into breakout groups and share and pray together. But above all things, may God speak to us today. May He speak to us personally. And collectively, because he desires his kingdom to come upon his children. So, so I'm excited for for what he for what he'll do today. Um, uh, as you'll, as most of you will know, I I don't normally um, host the fireside. Jan uh, Ranson does, who is the uh, CEO and founder of Flame. So she has done a video message for us to welcome us, and I think she's got a couple of things to share about um, some upcoming uh, flame events that are going on. So um, we'll listen to that video now. Oh, good morning to the fireside. I'm really sorry that I can't be with you uh, this morning, but I am in, I am in uh, Big Brion Sea in Devon, um, and we're running Forge Devon down here. Um, there's also Forge Scotland going on this weekend as well in Glasgow. And I believe that Flame are, are speaking, ministering to over 100 people this morning. So I wanted to just greet you because I haven't seen you for two months. But um, I'm praying for you. And I want you to know that you're welcome on the far side. And um, I hope also that um, uh, the, the far side... Uh, will continue to grow and so please keep inviting people. The one thing I wanted to say was I I came back at the end of August um, from Istanbul where we were ministering to uh, Farsi speak speaking people and we flew them out of their nation and returned them and uh, we had five days with them where we were just teaching into the lives of the persecuted church and it was nothing short of miraculous. Uh, Val has just returned from Arua in Uganda where she spoke to DTS w YWAM students. And also she went into um, the refugee camp, Rhino camp, which is one of the biggest camps in um, Uganda and, uh, and ministered to uh, 45 uh, South Sudanese pastors and again uh, there was a real depth I understand of emotional healing and forgiveness so we've had some remarkable missions in the last um, couple of, uh, in the last couple of months and I head off I hope next uh, Sunday to Armenia where you will know that there, that, that it's fairly unstable uh, during that time I'm taking a team of 10 there will be uh, uh, there will be, uh, we will be going out into the regions and uh, looking to see if we can bring comfort to those that need comfort. Have a great morning with, um, with Tristan and with Gail. God bless. Thank you, Jan. Um, okay, so uh, we'll start off, I've got a couple of notices just to share um, before I pass over to Gail, but um, we we continue uh, giving out our um, our magazines, flame magazines called Burning Issues, and it's 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 filled with such encouraging and truthful um, uh, writings and um, and articles in there. So if you don't yet have them, you're uh, very welcome to sign up, and I think the link will come onto the chat soon. Um, on another thing, many of you will be aware that we are. Um, that intercession hubs for the nations that flame impact around the world are being birthed um, as we speak. And it's a really exciting thing, just knowing the importance of prayer at the foundation of flame's ministry. And um, if you are interested in joining a hub um, and would like to know more, then, then again, you can follow a link to our website and, and I'll definitely be in um, communication with you about that. It's really exciting just gathering small groups to intercede for the nations. 
Um, so that's just the notices, and I'll pass you over to Gail. Gail is one of the one of the crew who is set to be going to Armenia next week. So it's really um, great to have her speak to us this morning for a devotion. So thank you very much, Gail. Thanks, Tristan. Okay, um, hello everybody. It's uh, a real privilege to to be here, and uh, as always. Um, I just learn so much myself uh, each time I'm, I'm here and I look forward to what Tristan's got to bring to us. But um, I've been asked to just bring a, a short devotional on the subject of transmitting God's power. And that's actually through the laying on of hands. Now, for some of you, this might just be a normal part of church life. And uh, for others, it may seem like a subject you haven't actually considered. But I hope that I may be able to bring something that we can all consider and bring more fully into our walk with God. If we think about the laying on of hands as transmitting God's power, i.e. blessings from one person in Christ to another person. So we're like, you could say like a conduit. So the blessing comes ultimately from the Holy Spirit to the recipient. Just think, um, you know, you might think that, well, putting your hand on someone um, when you're praying or doing something is a bit awkward. But if you think about in the past, when you've just naturally placed a hand on someone, maybe there was a child and you just put your hand on them to bring comfort, or even an adult by putting your hand on their arm or shoulder when they were sharing something that was upsetting. Or maybe you've shaken hands in a welcome to someone well, these are just natural gestures of connection. And so looking into the spiritual context, there's this transmission of blessings, like we said, through the laying on of hands, which could include a number of things. I mean, there's authority, wisdom, uh, the Holy Spirit and spiritual gifts or ministry. Um, so I'm just going to look at a couple of examples from the Old Testament and then there'll be um, a couple from the new obviously there's quite a lot but um, this is just a devotional so I'll keep it relatively brief and um, I just hope that as Christ followers we can see how we can use it in the context that we are living in ourselves well one reason why we lay hands on a person is to bless them so an example is in Genesis 48 verses 8 to 19 and here it's when Israel, the, the man Israel, originally known as Jacob, uh, sees Joseph's sons. And he says, you know, he says to his son, well, who are these? And Joseph says to his father, well, they're my sons whom God has given me. And he said, well, bring them to me, please, that I may now bless them. Well, the eyes of this man Israel were dim with age that he couldn't see them very well. So Joseph brought them near and he kissed them and embraced them. And, Joseph, and Israel said to Joseph, um, I never expected to see your face. And behold, God has let me see your offspring also. Then Joseph removed them from the knees of Israel and he bowed down himself with his face to the earth. And Joseph took them both, Ephraim in his right hand towards Israel's left, and Manasseh, the older son, in his left hand towards Israel's right, and he brought them near him. So basically, the right hand is the hand that gives the greater blessing in those days. And uh, it was usual for the firstborn to receive the greater blessing. So the oldest, the firstborn son would be blessed by the right hand. So Israel stretches out his right hand, but he actually, in fact, lays it on Ephraim, who was the youngest son. And he puts his left hand on the hand of Manasseh, which he did by crossing his hands over and he blessed Joseph and said, the God before whom my fathers Abraham and Isaac walked, the God who has been my shepherd all my life long to this day, the angel who has redeemed me from all evil, bless these boys and in them let my name be carried on and the name of my fathers and let them grow into a multitude in the midst of the earth. So remember, he's proclaiming the promise of God that came to Abraham, that Abraham would be a father of a multitude of nations and would be fruitful. And that the covenant between Abraham and God would continue through his offspring and throughout the generations as an everlasting covenant. 
And that's found in Genesis 17 verses 1 to 8, if you want to look at that another time. But of course, this blessing was now given to Ephraim and Manasseh, and it was back to front. And Joseph saw that his father had laid his right hand on Ephraim, and it displeased him. And he took his father's hand off Ephraim's head to move it, sorry, to move it to Manasseh's head. And Joseph said to his father, not that way, my father, this, this is the firstborn son. Put your hand on his head. And his father refused and said, I know my son. I know he also will become a people and he shall also be great. Nevertheless, his younger brother shall be greater than he and his offspring shall become a multitude of nations. So he blessed them that day, saying, by you, Israel will pronounce blessing, saying that God made you as Ephraim and as Manasseh. So the blessing was taken extremely seriously with the laying on of hands. And that blessing was then transferred to the next generation, as it were. And we can, do, we can do the same. We can bless our children. We can bless people in the family. We can bless people in the church family by laying hands on them and speaking out blessing over them. You know, this isn't a, a trivial thing, um, as you can see from this example. A more simple example of laying on of hands may be found in Deuteronomy 34, verse 9, where it says, And Joshua, the son of Nun, was full of the spirit of wisdom, for Moses had laid hands on him. And so we see it here very simply that Moses laid hands on Joshua for a specific gift which he received. I can recall many years ago in my old church where I came to faith, I'd been a Christian for about seven years and I was moving out of the area. And at the end of my last service, church service, I went up to the pastor's wife because I'd really watched her over the previous years and how she'd lived life. And I noticed she was a real wisdom, uh, a real woman of wisdom. Well, as a young Christian, I had a lot of zeal and a lot of enthusiasm, but I have to admit, I didn't seriously have a lot of wisdom. And I thought, I need some of that wisdom that she has. And I asked if she could pray that somehow I could have that gift of wisdom. So she actually laid hands on me and prayed I would receive an impartation of that wisdom. And as time's gone by, it's been interesting to notice how many women have sought me out and they've specifically said, I'm looking for wisdom. And it always makes me inwardly smile because I think of that lady who laid hands on me all those years ago. And as we come now into the New Testament, the praying and laying on of hands, it can be used, for example, to commission people for a purpose. If we consider the book of Acts at uh, chapter six, starting from verse two, the 12 gathered all the disciples together and said it would not be right for us to neglect the ministry of the word of God in order to wait on tables. Brothers and sisters, choose seven men from among you who are known to be full of the spirit and wisdom and we will turn this responsibility over to them and will give our attention to prayer and ministry of the word. Well this proposal pleased the whole group so they chose Stephen a man full of faith and the Holy Spirit, also Philip, Prochorus, Nicanor, Timon, Parmenas and Nicholas from Antioch, a convert to Judaism. They presented these men to the apostles who prayed and laid their hands on them. So these men were from, you could say, the congregation. It's not about just a leadership thing, um, but they were being commissioned for the task of waiting on tables. And I think maybe in this day we might think, well, that's a, that's a, a trivial thing. That's such a, a menial task. But, you know, this was to ensure a fair distribution of food among the widows, which was especially vital in that culture. And so, again, I say, you know, let's not think of the laying on hands as something minor. I guess the most commonly used reason we tend to lay hands on someone is when we are praying for healing. Jesus said in Mark 16, verse 18, about his disciples that they will lay hands on the sick and that they will recover. So laying hands on the sick was a way of ministering God's healing to them. When Ananias was told by the Lord to go to Paul after he had lost his sight on the road to Damascus, 
it says in Acts chapter 9 verse 17 that he laid his hands on him and Paul's sight was restored and we know that Paul in turn did extraordinary miracles including in Acts 28 verse 8 where he himself prayed and laid hands on a sick man in Malta and he was healed. When I became a Christian at 30 years old, I became a part of a church where the laying on of hands for healing was pretty standard. So it was relatively automatic for me to do this. I can recall an elderly lady with a limp and a walking stick coming and sitting on a chair for prayer we had put out during an outreach. outreach. She explained that years prior, she had broken a foot and had a metal plate put in it, but it was still a problem and she still had a lot of pain. So myself and a friend in the Lord knelt down and we both put a hand on her foot. And as we prayed, we could feel the plate literally moving around underneath our hand. We were surprised when she got up, thanked us and still walked off with a limp. The end of my story about the lady and her foot. I think maybe uh, uh, halfway through the, the, the metal was moving and... Okay, fine. All right. I wasn't she sure. She walked off with a limp. Right. Okay. She walked off with a limp. Okay, fine. All right. So she walked, she walked off for a, uh, anyway, she walked off with a limp. So anyway, two weeks later, she returned and she explained as she walked home, her foot seemed to improve. And by the time she got through the front door, she wasn't in pain. She put her walking stick to one side and walked up and down the stairs. No problem. And then went and knocked on the doors of all those in her cul-de-sac to show them that Jesus had healed her. Hallelujah. However, if someone comes up and asks us to minister to them and they are of the opposite gender, it is best to get at least one other person of the same gender to be present. So if someone is saying they want healing in a particular area of their body and they're not the same gender, it is better that they put their hand on the area whilst we have a hand lightly on their shoulder, because we do need to be wise. Another reason for laying hands on someone in prayer is that they want to be filled with the Holy Spirit. In Acts, there is a story of Philip who brought many to Christ and they were baptised. But it seems the believers were not filled with the Holy Spirit. In fact, in Acts 8, verses 14 to 16, it says, now, when the apostles who were at Jerusalem heard that, heard that Samaria had received the word of God, they sent Peter and John to them, who, when they had come down, prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Spirit. For as yet, he had not fallen on them. They had only been baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Then they laid hands on them and they received the Holy Spirit. So we need to be mindful of that, that people might have received Christ and yet not yet have received the Holy Spirit. And so again, we can lay hands on people and just bless them and call on for the impartation of that Holy Spirit. Now, usually when we lay hands uh, on people, it's an impartation of God's power that's positive and encourages and strengthens us. But we do need to consider certain things. Um, I remember years ago, I was in a home group and I asked for prayer. And a lady I didn't know very well came and laid her hands on me and prayed. And in the prayer, she included a lot of Ecclesiastes um, chapter three. You know, there's a time to tear down. There's a time to scatter. There's even a time to give up. And to be honest, by the time I finished, she finished, I felt so heavy hearted. I went home and I actually didn't feel very well. So I rang up a friend of mine who was quite a lot older and more experienced than the Lord. And she said, well, you know, that lady suffers from bouts of depression. And I think what's happened is when she laid hands on you and was praying, it's been counterproductive. And maybe she's transmitted something that was actually ungodly. So anyway, um, this friend, she came around. She laid hands on me and prayed, bound and commanded anything ungodly to go. And it went. And suddenly my heart was lifted and I just could really sense that freedom. So you do need to be aware of who's actually laying hands on you and praying for you so that you're not maybe contaminated by a spirit that's ungodly. 
And of course, that goes for us as well. When we're going to pray for someone else, we need to make sure that we've got clean hands and a pure heart before God and that we're not likely to be praying anything or transmitting anything ourselves that would be to another's detriment. So we need to ensure that we're not harboring unforgiveness or bitterness and that we are right with God before we lay hands on other people. And so the laying on of hands should be really encouraging. There's a real sense of togetherness and unity. And if you haven't done it before, or if you're with people who aren't used to it, you know, I, I tend to say if I'm out doing street work, for example, um, and usually people have never even been prayed for, never, never mind someone laying hands on them. And if I'm talking to someone, I'll say to them, you know, do you mind if I just lay a hand on your shoulder while I pray for you? And no one's actually ever said no. And there's a real sense of connection as we stand together and pray. Well, I hope um, that's given you something to think about and consider as you go on in your walk with the Lord in whatever capacity that is. Uh, remember, we can do this. It helps with unity in the spirit. And it's a real way of being able to bless others in prayer and healing and commissioning by laying on of hands. So do keep that in mind when you're praying for people. And may you really find that you're imparting and receiving impartation from God and may we be all blessed in it, in Jesus' name. Amen. So I'll, I'll hand back to Tristan. Yeah, thank you, Gail. That's a really good and um, important uh, message uh, that you've given us. Thank you. It's, it's encouraging and there's wisdom as well. And so I think you, I think that's that's made a lot of sense. And I just want to pray for us all now, Lord, that that we, we thank you, Lord, that you you use us for your glory, Lord, that we that we as your as the body of Christ can be used by the Holy Spirit to be the hands and feet of Jesus, that where Jesus can cannot lay his physical hand on people to, to heal and to bless and empower, you use us, your your children the servants of the Lord to do your work, Lord. And we just we just confess our need for the Holy Spirit, Lord, that uh, our need of the Holy Spirit to be led by him um, in, in all that we do in all, of, in all of our ministry, Lord. So we thank you, Father God, for that. And Lord, I'm just reminded that that your kingdom is not a matter of, of word, but of power, Lord. And so we thank you for the power, Lord, that you have and that you pour out on the earth, Lord. And so today, Lord, we pray that you will pour out your power, that there should be power amongst us, the power to heal, the power to set us free, Lord. Um, and, and we pray, Lord, that your kingdom shall come in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, Gail. Yeah, and um, and so I'll, I'll, I'm, I'm going to be speaking um, this morning about moving from rejection to acceptance and, and again, just recognising um the need for power you know god's got something to do um in in this we can't do it ourselves and i i as i've been really mulling over um rejection to acceptance um i really believe that rejection is one of the deepest and most common uh, and one of those the most debilitating wounds that we can have as human beings because it goes directly against the heart of our being. We've been created in love to be loved. And so I really believe that rejection is, is such a powerful enemy that wants to block um, one of the main purposes, purposes of our being, to be loved by God and, 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 and to know love amongst one another and with the Lord. It's, it's, it's a really powerful enemy. And we all know what it's like to, to be rejected and how it can make us feel. And, and different people, um, they will often deal with it in different ways, um, but it can still hurt us. One of the main... Um, things about rejection is that its root can be so deep in us that we don't even recognize it for what it is but we consider it in, instead just a part of who we are and and our identity and we might go through life not really recognizing that we feel rejected 
deep down. But what I but what I've seen is that many of the pains and fears and struggles that we have in our daily lives can actually be rooted in rejection. Now, I've even noticed this myself recently, just in the last couple of weeks. Um, one example is I, I'm, I'm living in a, um, a community of believers at the moment. And something happened um, last week where there was a bit of a, a struggle uh, with, 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 with a situation. And so I, I um, suggested something. I was like, perhaps we need to do this. And I thought it was wise. I thought it was, it was sensible. Um, but the response was not what I thought it was going to be. The response was, oh, that's that's really thoughtful and, and caring, Tristan. But no. And for some reason, that just really hurt me. And it was grinding against stuff in the like, ouch. And, 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 and it took me about two days to be going through, like, why does this still hurt? It was something so small, but it's just really grinded on something within me for dude for two days i'm forgiving and i'm like yeah and i'm repenting where i'm trying i'm trying to repent but i realized that that actually at the root of it is is because of what my suggestion was rejected i felt rejected as a person and it made me realize that when i sort of make suggestions to my elders and if that's sort of rejected as such i'm often quite okay with that so okay that's fine you know you you'll you'll know better than me generally but when my suggestions can be rejected by my peers sometimes that can hurt even more and i realize that it's that a root of it has been my sibling rivalry and so 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 some of the things that we can feel in our daily life can can not appear as directly rejection, but actually there's a real deep root of it um, that is that's good to 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 recognise. So as we consider moving from rejection to acceptance, I, I also think about biblical terms like going from glory to glory, and going from glory to glory suggests that we're headed in one direction. And that you go deeper and deeper into that thing. From glory to glory. And that's absolutely right. But as we consider moving from rejection to acceptance, we need to see that it is a total turning around. These two forces are in opposition to one another. And we're required to forcefully turn away from one and turn towards the other, to literally reject one and accept the other. And there's a battle in that, but it's something that we've got to recognise. Even though we may have suffered with being rejected by people or circumstances, we know that the Lord is the one who can truly heal our wounds of rejection and redeem us out of the darkness of rejection. Healing and freedom comes when we find our satisfaction and life-giving joy in the truth of being wholly accepted by our Father in heaven and our Lord. And then this gives us the power to overcome in this life the struggles and realities of facing rejection. Jesus says, in this world, you will have trouble. But take heart, I have overcome the world. So even though in this world, in this life, we will suffer pain and troubles, we are to take heart, because as we lift our eyes to Jesus, we can see over the troubles we have in this world and find peace and joy in our souls. We alone can't do it. We can't heal our wound and change our belief systems and how we feel. Only God truly can. But we can partner with God positioning ourselves in the right posture of faith and truth, and then we see what the Lord does. But before we can receive his help, we need to understand something more of the nature of the problem. 
In its simplest form, rejection is a feeling of being unwanted, unacceptable, or being excluded. We desire people to love us and appreciate us and accept us, but rejection will say that we believe that they don't. We can have feelings of betrayal and shame and not feeling valued by others. And this wound of rejection can be so deep that it causes our spirit to be crushed. In Proverbs 15, 13, it says, A happy heart makes the face cheerful, but heartache crushes the spirit. In our heart, we can hold on to the pain that can come from being or feeling rejected, and this crushes the human spirit. Something I want to say into this immediately is that Jesus has such enormous compassion for those who are crushed in spirit. He's deeply moved by our pain and wants to strengthen us. Consider Psalm 103 verses 1 to 6. Praise the Lord, O my soul, all my inmost being, praise his holy name. Praise the Lord, my soul, and forget not all his benefits, who forgives all your sins and heals all your diseases, who redeems your life from the pit and crowns you with love and compassion who satisfies your desires with good things so that your youth is renewed like the eagles. The Lord works righteousness and justice for all the oppressed. Jesus wants to comfort us and heal us where we hurt so deeply. So considering the the nature of rejection, the the feeling of of being unwanted and unappreciated and and excluded, we must ask the Lord and seek insight as to when in our lives have we felt rejected and what are some of the results of that? How has this affected the way I think about myself, others, and God? Have I put in coping mechanisms around my heart to guard it from further pain? When we seek greater insight into these things and bring them to the Lord, he can begin to unravel the lies and wrong beliefs that we have and minister his truth and love to us that we can receive with more open hearts. So how might we have felt rejected, unwanted, or unappreciated in the past? First, I want to consider some ways which we can suffer from rejection that we may have no personal memory of, but it may have caused wounding in our spirit anyway. First, consider generational inheritance. We can be hugely influenced by our family's ancestors, And if there is a common trend of people in the family being and feeling rejected and unwanted, then that is a sign of an ungodly generational inheritance that is being passed down the family line. Living in the state of expecting and feeling rejected can be taught and presented as normal to the children and to their children, and to their children, and so on. So this can be a generational spirit of rejection, but through Jesus we can be set free from ungodly family inheritance as we enter into God's family and receive his family blessings, the blessings of Christ. Another consideration is that even as we're being formed in our mother's womb, we can suffer from the wounding of rejection because even though our minds and body may be totally unaware in the spirit we can be hurt from other people's rejection perhaps it was an unwanted pregnancy 
Perhaps your mother had a traumatic experience while she was pregnant. Perhaps even there was an attempted abortion. These such things are so sad and it's so important to find in our heart the strength to forgive our mother or father and turn our attention on the truth that our God is the one who says before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. He was purposely intentional of our creation. Perhaps there was a rejection at birth. There may have been a lack of bonding with, with your mother or father, and they may have wanted a boy and got a girl instead. And this can cause deep rejection to, to young children. Then there may be ways in which we felt rejected throughout our lives that we may have more memory of. The early years of childhood in particular are critical in shaping the minds and belief systems of people. The things that happen to us as children and how they perceive the world around them are the building blocks for everything else to be built on top of. So if our parents or family members were judgmental, dominating, controlling, or abusive, then this teaches the child, you're not important. If we felt like a non-favored child and there was strong sibling rivalry, we could end up believing that the only way to be loved by our parents was to work for it and be better than the others. And we'd grow up always comparing ourselves with other people. But God has no favourites. Perhaps at school you may have been bullied, always chosen last in the school team, told that you were stupid by others and even by your teachers, and this can cause someone to have self-rejection, and I'll talk more about that later. Perhaps later on in life, you may have been hurt by rejection in your marriage and family life, marital unfaithfulness or divorce, family breakdown, empty nest syndrome, or growing old and feeling lonely. We can be rejected at the workplace, in church, being ignored, not valued, not promoted, and all through life even being different from others in terms of race, or colour, or size, or disabilities. There are many, many ways in which we can feel rejection, and each can be so painful, and people will feel more rejection from some things that others won't, and vice versa. But what the reality is, is that rejection in some form is something that we all have experienced and it causes deep pain. When we're rejected, we can often react with emotional pain and anger and fear, bitterness, criticism, jealousy, inability to express oneself and judging and rejecting others. And these reactions are a way of trying to put the pain of rejection onto another person. I find it helpful to know these things so that when I recognise them in myself, that I can choose not to sin in these reactions, but to go straight to the root of why I feel rejected and then overcome it in the grace of Jesus. As we all know, it is easier to see the fruit of something than the root of something. So when we see in ourselves or when we're ministering to others and we're expressing these types of emotions and reactions, then we know that the root may very well be, have you been rejected and do you still feel that? On one hand, the fruit of rejection can be this more aggressive, angry, unforgiving reaction where we try to put the blame onto other people to justify ourselves. But on the other hand, we can keep all the pain within ourselves and the fruit is more about self-rejection. And the underlying attitude of self-rejection 
ends up with beliefs like I'm worthless and others are right to reject me. This reaction to rejection may include feelings of shame or guilt, withdrawal, uh, a low self-image, worthlessness, hopelessness, inferiority, a fear of failure, a fear of others' opinions, depression, pessimism, these, these types of things. And, and someone who's, self, um, who, who's suffering with self-rejection can feel overwhelmed with despair. And, and a downward spiral can, can even develop, going from a feeling of being isolated to, to self-pity, which then goes to self-condemnation, self-hatred. And then this can even lead to potential self-harm or, or in the worst case scenario, even um, suicide. They may take refuge in work and other false comforts, or they may be striving to earn acceptance by being successful or people-pleasing um, with uh, attitudes like perfectionism or um, you know, sort of self-centered independence. All of these defensive actions that were mentioned, which, which are trying to cover the hurt, hold other people at a distance. And it's difficult to therefore trust others and form good two-way relationships. So I mentioned in the beginning that the wound of rejection is one of the most debilitating wounds we can have because rejection is destructive to good relationships, including in our relationship with God. There may be the lie, no one cares for me, so I must look after myself which keeps away the acceptance and comfort and love of others and of God. And it's the underlying beliefs against others or ourselves that underpin the ungodly behaviours that are associated with rejection, which can then open the door to spirits of rejection, betrayal or anger. And so when there's a demonic hold, on this area, then this bondage causes the feelings and reactions and behaviours to, to, to really um, flourish much more. So we've spoken um, sort of about the, the, the tree of rejection, that we can be wounded by rejection from the earliest part of life and, and even inherit, through, uh, inherit it through our family line. Or we can experience rejection um, throughout our lives, in childhood, as we grow up, in our relationships, both family and friends, but we can be wounded by rejection and caused to believe things about ourselves and others which are not entirely true. And these are all elements of the root of the tree of rejection. Then from that, we can put up defences around our heart, through aggressive reactions or self-rejection, and ungodly behaviours can begin to grow um, from these things. And, and when we really then start adopting these, these ungodly behaviours and these beliefs, we can give way to, to demonic oppression um, by allowing the devil to have a foothold or stronghold in our lives. So these ungodly behaviours become much more evident in our lives and produce bad fruit. And a bad tree produces bad fruit. And the bad tree can be the wound of rejection. So it's always this, this trying to look at the root of things, looking at the root of the bad fruit. And so often it's rejection. So as we begin to look at God's solution for rejection, and have a time of prayer and breakout groups, we need to first position ourselves with a desire for God to change us. As I said, moving from rejection to acceptance requires a total turning around, and we need to join in the effort of doing that. We've got to believe that it's what God wants for us. It's Father God's heart to bring his children into more of the fullness of his unconditional love 
and acceptance of us. In Ephesians 1, 3 to 5, it's written, Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ. For he chose us in him before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight. In love, in love, he predestined us for adoption to sonship through Jesus Christ in accordance with his pleasure and will. And on the cross, Jesus took all of the rejection of mankind on himself. For a moment, he suffered the rejection of people and of God. And alone on the cross, cried out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? But God accepted Christ's offering of himself and raised him from the dead. And so through Jesus, those who believe in him and join ourselves to him, in his death and resurrection, then we can also receive the acceptance, the love and peace from God the Father. Jesus bore our rejection, our humiliation, our shame upon himself so that we might receive the acceptance and honour with the Father. And this is how Jesus can say, don't be afraid little flock, for it gives your father great pleasure to give you the kingdom. It's to the father's great pleasure to give his children the kingdom. God chose us and accepted us in Christ to be his children and his beloved, the beloved ones. So with that, we should have the strength and the grace to then face our enemy of rejection. With this encouragement that God is for us, has always has been and always will be, we can face the enemy of rejection. And so I'd say that the first step in, in this journey is to recognise then that we've been wounded by rejection and when we confess that recognition it's like shining the spotlight on the root and, and acknowledging that there is pain and so therefore we can begin to deal with it as we've spoken at the root of rejection is the fact that we have been rejected by someone or we have felt rejected by someone and so there's a need to forgive those who we have been hurt by. Remember also there may be a need to um, forgive our ancestors who may have brought this down the family line and to ask Jesus to, to break the power of that ungodly generational influence and bring us more into the blessings of being the children of God. And when, when we forgive the people who have directly rejected us or who we feel rejected by or, or our generational ancestors, we must also repent of our ungodly reactions, our anger, our criticalness of others, where we have hurt ourselves, where we have not trusted God to be our healer, but taken the matter into our own hands. As we repent, we must open our hearts to receive God's forgiveness. For if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. There may be some things that we need to release. Perhaps a need to release some of the emotional pain that we've been carrying with us. Perhaps there's a need to release some anger. And if that's done in a godly way, it's very important to release that anger. 
This is about getting rid of the ungodly stuff that has overwhelmed us and darkened our soul, really. And, and there may uh, also be a need for deliverance from evil spirits, such as spirits of rejection or a spirit of a fear of rejection or control and anger and bitterness, however the Holy Spirit wants to lead us. So the, the, there's that element, and then a really important part of, of turning from rejection to acceptance is in our beliefs, what we believe about ourselves, others, and God. When we believe in lies rooted in rejection that I'm unwanted, that I can't offer anything beneficial to others. Don't trust me to bring anything good. That people don't care for me. And that God loves me conditionally, dependent on what I do. Then we need to overcome these lies with the word of God. It's the word of God, the truth that can break down the stronghold of lies that we've believed. When we begin to proclaim and declare over ourselves the truth of God's word, you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. And we pray that by the power of God's spirit, that this truth will overcome and destroy the lies. And that new seeds, godly seeds, will be sown into our hearts and cared for and will grow so that there be an abundance of fruit of righteousness and love. And this is a, this is a journey. Um, and, and an important part of, of our sanctification and becoming more like Christ. But as we, um, as we are about to go into breakout groups, um, we can share and pray about some of these things. Um, and I just wanted to pray over us now a prayer from Ephesians 3, 16 to 21. I pray that out of his glorious riches, he may strengthen you with power through his spirit in your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. And I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, may have power together with all the Lord's holy people, to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ, and to know this love that surpasses knowledge, that ye may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we can ask or imagine, according to his power that is at work within us. To him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations, forever and ever. Amen. So as we begin now to go into our breakout groups, we can share together of some of the pain we can be prayed for, we can be proclaiming truth. Because God wants us to know more and more how he has adopted us as his children for his glory. So um, be blessed in this time. And, and then after the breakout groups, we'll gather again together um, just to finish off. But thank you, Mars.